Well, good afternoon, just barely afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, this is, I'm Philip Martin. This is uh, Ben McGrath, and we're here uh, for the very first live session of the um, 2023 Six Bridges Literary Festival, and we're glad you're here. We're going to be talking about Ben's book, uh, River Man. Ben, which I promised to keep this very short, is a staff writer for The New Yorker, and I will just say that uh, this book is a brilliant example of old school, you know, uh, boots on the ground journalism. And with that, I'm just going to turn it over to you to do whatever you'd like. There you go, it's green. Um, so I, I'm going to step over there for a second and I'll read a, a short passage just to give you a kind of a taste of this. It's, I'm, I'm going to focus. Um, less on my own writing and give the, the, the main character of the book the, the starring role here because I think that's more important to give you a sense of why I was drawn into this project in the first place. But um, picture, that, so the, the cover of the hardcover here is a, is a picture of, that he took. Uh, this is the man named Dick Conant who uh, came down the Hudson River on a plastic canoe. And this is, that's my town. It just ha so happens that he took that picture as he was going past our house. I had a few conversations with him on the river uh, and kind of couldn't help going back and thinking about it more and more. So I'll, I'll just read a little passage from one of our conversations. So to set the scene, picture this guy, he's kind of a little bit like Santa Claus in, uh, in overalls, in, in denim overalls with, with big boots. He's like maybe 6'2", 300 pounds. Um, and I, uh, I had a toddler at the time, so I, I, would, I was sort of sneaking away to go talk, listen to this guy talk on the riverbank and then realizing I had to go back to pick up my kid at daycare. So that's where we pick up. Um, Let me tell you one more story before you go, he said as I made a rapid calculation of how many minutes I could save by driving 70 instead of the usual 60 on the parkway. I see lots of wonderful birds on trips like this. I should, sorry, I should step aside and add, I live in New York, he was on his way to Florida in a canoe. When I first started seeing great blue herons many years ago, I was just enthralled with them. Such a graceful bird. They have this guttural squawk. I don't know if you've ever heard it. Very rarely have I seen them actually catch fish, because when I come by, they're wary of me. And they can just jump up and be airborne. That's how graceful they are. They're amazing, amazing animals. One day, I was paddling down the Mississippi River, doing what I call night passage, another aside. Turns out he'd been doing a lot of these trips, just you know, Yellowstone River, Mississippi River, Missouri River, Tennessee River. Um, I had a full moon, was maybe 100 to 200 yards from shore. So I'm on the edge of the current, you know? I'm on the margin. I'm not doing four knots, but I'm moving. Two knots, that's enough. That's what I do on slack water anyhow. And I just thought, well, I'll sit back. He gestured toward the rubber bumper tethered to the canoe's stern, which I now understood to be a pillow. You see, I have a little resting thing, so I'm looking at the moon and just relaxing. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, this huge male comes swooping in right next to my port gunnel, and he was just about to put his talons. He had these really long, skinny fingers with both feet. He was just about ready to grab my gunnel, which is bad news, man, because he could tip me. And I went, whoa, like that, right? And he goes, I'll do what he did. He goes, doink. Conan turned his head sharply and exposed the whites of his eyes. So he's looking at me, right? But he never did grab my gunnel. He just flapped his wings. He was hovering. He flapped his wings, I think, three or four times. I could feel the wind in my face. And his beak, it looked like a dagger man. <laughs> he's like this close to my face, and he's got these beady eyes. The moon was glinting off the surface of his eyeballs. We're looking at each other like this. <laughs> then all of a sudden, he goes, woof, a couple flaps, and he was gone. Conant closed his eyes for a moment, scratching behind his ear. I thought I'd leave you with that, he said, chuckling. I don't play patty cake with wild animals. Sorry, I wish I was like that guy from Alaska that was making friends with all the bears, and then the bears ate him. Before I left, he asked if he could keep the printout from the Texas Fisherman's Forum and suggested that I write my name and number on the back for future reference. Okay. It's 2014, which is a long time ago, and way before, the things were very different in 2014. And you uh, encounter this character, this, you live along the river, 
uh, and you encounter this character who your neighbor points out to you, who is like this 300-pound uh, Santa Claus in a cheap canoe that's stuffed to the gills and stuff like that. You're fascinated by him. You write about him for the New Yorker for the talk of the town. And then some months later, you get a, you get a call from a, a sheriff in uh, North Carolina, and they found your contact information in an overtone, overturned canoe. Yeah, so that, that the way I ended that passage there where I say yeah. he asked if I could write my contact information on the back of the form I'd given him, that those very words I wrote on the paper ended up being the, 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 thing, the first things they pulled out of an upside-down canoe in, in the waters of North Carolina three mm -hmm. months later. So they thought it was your canoe, maybe. They did. Think it, they, yeah. they called me, and they said, they asked, and they, it turned out they were hoping I was going to say, oh, you found my canoe. Um, and I said, no, uh, but I, I know whose canoe that is. Yeah. To give you another sense of the, the cheapness of the canoe, what I later learned, he, this is a canoe that he bought. He started the journey in, in Plattsburgh, New York, which is as close as you could get to the Canadian border by Greyhound bus. Um, he was based in Montana. Uh, and he got off the, the Greyhound bus with just a backpack, walked to Dick's Sporting Goods, bought a canoe for $200, bought a pair of wheels for $40, put the canoe on the wheels and dragged it three miles alongside the highway until he found Lake Champlain and got in. So even just making it to my house from Plattsburgh to near New York City yeah. seemed pretty impressive in that boat. Yeah. But. Well, this guy, Dick Conant. Yep. Conant, right? Uh, he, was a, he was a Navy veteran. He had, I mean, he was, what, 40 years old. How old was he when he, we f took to the uh, river? Yeah, he was 43 when he first took the river. I met yeah. him, he was 63, but his right. first, yeah, his, his in, first in 19, And it was, he was one of these guys, um, we could say that he was an intelligent guy, he was very resourceful, he uh, had a lot of talent, he was a talented artist, but he never found a place in society, really, and he sort of took to the river to... Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that, that struck me is w when talking to him, you know, you meet a guy who's coming by himself, he's 63 years old, he's coming all the way down the country by himself in a $200 canoe, something's not right in his life, by conventional standards at least. But the way he talked, uh, he had so much natural social confidence and he was ex clearly very well read, he was up on all the current events. and isn't that, um, So one of the things that interested me in, in trying to piece his story together after he disappeared um, was that he had not, you know, he comes down, he's a kind of figure on the margins, kind of homeless guy in a canoe, but he hadn't been, you, when he was in, I learned when he was in high school, he was National Honor Society, prom king. Um, uh, when he was in college, he got a scholarship, played varsity sports, w um, was in a fraternity or kind of anti hippie fraternity. Um, he had been the, sort of the most charismatic person in every room he'd been in for most of his life until young adulthood. And then, then there's this gap here where things weren't working. You know, it, something, he couldn't achieve that kind of same social uh, stardom that he'd had as a child and as a very young man as he became a more proper adult. And so he, you know, he joined the Navy, he tried to go to medical school, he thought about going to law school. These were all things that I think he thought were, were at the level that he was destined for as a person who had been a child star. And then, yeah, in, in sort of middle age, he reinvented himself as a, as a kind of somewhat unprecedented folk heroic character, a river wanderer. Um, mm -hmm. And in an unlikely way, became that same kind of star that he'd been. As a, as a child, because he was about as good at that as anyone had ever been. Yeah, it, the thing that strikes me about this book, that had he come along a little bit later maybe, or maybe had he had a little bit more, I don't know, media savvy or something, he could have like been strapped on a GoPro and become like a, one of these internet guys that's, that's vlogging from the river and showing everything, because he's doing remarkable stuff, and he's got this instinct to record everything. Uh, you ended up with, with his materials, with his, with his archives, basically, which is 
what you drew from for this book, right? Yeah, and, and look, I should say, one of the things that drew me to him initially, after my very first meeting with him, is he, you know, he was a, you know, kind of unforgettable figure, and he was well-spoken. And I went back, and I did the thing we all do when we meet a new person, I put his name into Google, and there was almost nothing. I mean, like, and it was, there was a part of me that thought, wow, this is like the last undigital man left. Yeah. You know, it's, here, here's a 63-year-old man who's ex extremely well-read, who's apparently traveled all over the country and can, can, like, recount these endless stories about this or that Baptist church that he visited in Louisiana in 2007. And there's, n there's like, two indications on the, in on the Internet that he even existed at all. And that's a, you know, this is a, he was just on that one side of that generational line because at the same time, it's not like he was really trying to leave no trace. He was writing everything down. He was just writing it down like in a notebook rather than putting it on the internet. So there was this kind of remarkable opportunity. He was just caught in this one slice of time where it was possible to be sort of historically invisible and yet have left a complete, I mean nearly a complete record of his entire life which turned out to be in these storage lockers mm -hmm. out west. So what happened after he, we got that phone call uh, in North Carolina, one of his brothers uh, gathered all the belongings that were in the boat, not just the piece of paper with my name on it, but some of the other stuff. And among the things that they learned were that he was paying rent to these storage lockers right. out west. And opening those, it's, you know, it, it's like, you know, if, it's like finding the, someone's, you know, lifelong selfie role of, you know, it's like he, everything he documented, but it was just in pen and ink. It's, he's a fascinating guy. One of the things that's really fascinating to me is that he paid his bills. I mean, he was a, he, he was a responsible citizen. I mean, I think there's a passage in there where you talk about him being a responsible taxpayer, even though he's yeah. probably making $11,000, $12,000 a year. Where, yeah, I, I have his, you know, IRS forms, and he had like yeah. $8,762 of income, and he's still bothering to file Right, you know, they wouldn't come after you at that point, but he was filing anyway. Uh, um. He's it, there's an there's an American archetype about you know lighting out for the wilderness and going out and d d d you know and just about all the places you light out for you know maybe there's some place in Alaska the Chris McCandless sort of stuff you know you can find wild places in Arkansas, but he wasn't like looking to get away from society entirely, he was going from town to town along the river, and he would stop for a couple, and he slept outside. He was, he was a homeless guy when he was on land, right. and then we'd get on the river, he was kind of the superhero and stuff like that. Yeah, and that is an important way in which he differs, I think, from, you mentioned Christopher McCandless, who's, right. for those who don't remember, is the star of Into the Wild. That's, you know, that's a case where that was a person who was so fed up with human beings that he just wanted to be you know, in something purer, put that in scare quotes if you want, and, and went to the Alaskan bush. Dick Conant actually loved people. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and I think it really does relate to the fact that he was a popular person as a younger man. He was the life of, of, a, of a party. It just so happens that his adult life tended not to, <laughs> to bring people to him. He managed to push people away from him. Uh, and so he wanted to find a way to... Uh, to be the life of the party again. It right. was social, the rivers were a social life for him as much as they were a, a place of natural splendor. I mean, look, I mean, it, it's beautiful, that story with the heron and the cover of this book. He's definitely putting himself in, in, in pure places, in, in a sense, but punctuated by, by a, an active social life in every town. Yeah, it's a cycle. He, he, he goes into this town, he regales people with his with his stories. He, he's like this, he holds court, there's this Falstaffian character, and then he starts to realize he might wear out his welcome, you know, he might be being perceived as kind of a, kind of a bum, he might, right. the one thing that really I affected me about this was when you talked about, you know, how he'd feel shame at being dirty and stuff like that, and I, you know, and then he'd move on, and then, and the river is always like self-care therapy kind of stuff for him. I mean, yeah. it's like, that's where he... F yeah, I mean, I think it was kind of an ingenious coping mechanism. Yeah. Um, and there, you know, there are two sides to that, to that idea of feeling like he'd overstayed his welcome and, and wanted to move on. One side of it is that I, one of the things I learned both from reading his, um, his journals and from talking to his siblings is that he had a tendency toward paranoia of, of that sort. He, you know, he was sort of naturally inclined to, to fear that he was being unfairly judged. Mm -hmm. And that, that sort of ch 
forced him to, to sort of run away before things could go wrong. But there's also a sense in which he was shrewd, um, you know, not, not sort of, his brain wasn't leading him astray. There's a sense in which it's true. If you come into a new town for the first few days, you are kind of the king of the town and everyone is delighted. And then after a while, it's like, okay, this guy is a bit of a bum. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we, we can't hang out and listen to his stories all day. We got to go to work. <laughs> like, you know, we're going to drop in. Look, you will find tons of people who would, like, they were so enamored of this mysterious river king who drifted into their lives that they would drop everything for a day or two and right. take him around and sort of br they bring him to their birth their you know niece's birthday party and they'd welcome him into the you know their various social clubs he he wasn't a tourist he became a kind of an honorary townie in every one of these towns but then you know he's not actually a townie they, these people and some of these places are they're pretty cl close knit and right. you know, you're, if you're an outsider you know they're welcome they're welcome you for a little bit but then you're not you know, if there's only 30 people in this town, eventually you're like, you know, you don't have relatives in this town. Who are you? Why are you here? I don't want to skip over the reporting of this book because you actually became almost, I mean, you were following in footsteps, going back and meeting these same people, doing the same. And the, these people always remembered him, and they could almost always corroborate what he was, what yeah. he had said and what, what, what was in his journals or whatever, you know? Yeah, it's, so one of the things, I mean, I, I've talked about this with a few people, you know, there, there's a certain kind of person, a, a, a sort of self-styled adventurer type who has an inflated sense of his own role in a movie that's unfurling behind his eyes and kind of he's a character in his own script and you guys are all just extras. We all are familiar with those kinds of people. They tend, they're, they're interesting and they're, and they're tedious both. Uh, <laughs> and they tend to be kind of full of shit sometimes, yeah. right? Their stories are a little bit, you know, like, as the more each time they tell them, the you know the 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 dolphin becomes twenty feet instead of ten feet, and you know it's like, and it, and over time it just and you can kind of sense that and that's where you're you know you're like all right I'm I get, I'm late for an appointment I got to go. <laughs> um, the amazing thing with with Dick Conan is he was doing these things that seemed on the face of them so implausible. A lot of his stories that he would tell just sounded so unlikely, but they were also so specific and incidental in their details. So one of the first things that I started doing. As a sort of a gut check of like, am I am I am I, am I a little bit crazy myself in kind of pursuing this? Is this maybe this is just a trivial um, story? I would just start calling the people whose names appeared in his journals, or he or you know he in one case he told me about a dive bar in Carothersville, Missouri, in the Boot Heel, um, and he was like, you know, you can you can write that down. It's this wonderful place. They don't look down on anyone. And I just figured, all right, so this is here's a here's a test of you know, am I just sort of charmed by this eccentric obsessive, or is there is there some ballast here? And I would call people, and like instantly, people would be like, oh my god, like that was 15 years ago. We were just talking about him on Thursday. Wow. And and the other thing is, it turned out his story, like, if anything, he undersold his stories. So this bar, and this goes to your point about him like paying his his bills, to give you a sense of the kind of peculiar conscientiousness that he brought to his act of being a Vagabond. Um, I I went. I called, and then eventually traveled to to Carothersville to the Boot Heel to to visit this this bar, Woody's. And not only did they welcome him, but they the the owner, who's now since died, but Woody told me that there were a few nights the the, the river was flooding, so he kind of set up shop in that town for about three weeks, mm -hmm. uh, and he would kind of kind of do various chores with his boat during the day, and then he would kind of commute to work as a storyteller at Woody's at night, and he, he could put some down. Um, and there were a few nights when it was raining so hard that Woody, just for, for some reason, just sort of instinctively, that he had never done before, trusted this complete stranger, uh, and said, why don't you just sleep here in the bar? Uh, it's too, you know, it's, it's too wet out to, to walk, you know, half a mile back to the river. So he let this guy, just a bum off the river, sleep on a few occasions inside his bar after they closed. <laughs> and what they found when they came in the next day is that he had helped himself to a few a few more beers, but he had stacked them up and left money on the counter and had swept the place up. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's the, One of the things you get into in a little bit in the book is um, this idea, which uh, was, I guess, comes from a, a 1928 magazine story in Scribner's about the state of Riverland, which is this sort of country within our within our country where, you know, uh, people are happy to give, to quote 
you know, Queens Crowater. I mean, it's sort of like this sort of alternate kind of America, this, this town within a town. And if you live along the river, or if you spend a lot of time along the river, you will notice that you, it's Little Rock, North Little Rock, the riverfront is teeming with characters. Some characters you may not want to have much to deal with, but you know, we have these traveler kids who come into town on the rails and they're, and you know, they've got their, I, uh, their iPhones and are charging them in the, uh, in the streets and stuff like that. We run into them a lot. But this, it's almost like this secret, you know, when we lived in Hillcrest, we never knew about this. We never knew about this this community, this the way these people, you know, kind of come through here. I'm sure that Dick came through here, you know. Um, and it seems like there must be like this army of invisible people kind of always moving across the country. I mean, it's sort of disconcerting when you think about it. Yeah, so a, a couple things to add to that. So yeah, the, the, the idea is that there's kind of like a 51st state. You know, you have all your states yeah. and, the, and the, the, the state that the, uh, on the riverbank has, has more in common with itself no matter where you are than with, with, with any of the states it's in. That's right. And it's a little bit like in the, in the before while the, the country was being settled westward, right? The west was this kind of you know, cowboy frontier, it attracted lawless types and drifters, people who were running away from something. And so, and Alaska, of course, and, and Key West, you know, the, the sort of the far points also have long been the, the places for, for such people who are, you know, keep trying to run away from the, the conventions. So in, I think in Alaska, what's the line uh, that women say, you know, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. Um, <laughs> so the odds are, the, the odds are good. Yeah. Um, but the goods are odd. That's that sort of characterizes the the riverbank society as well. And I was so I and I was in a town um, I, as you mentioned. I, I I ended up kind of following in his in his wake mm -hmm. a little bit and visiting a lot of these places. Some of them are real small, like on the Ohio River in in southern Indiana. You know, I was in a town with I think the population was eleven. Right. And uh, and I met the mayor, of course, because there's not <laughs> that, not too many. The odds are good. Um, and, uh, and he mentions, and you know, we're, we've been talking for like two hours, you know, his son's running around and he's like, oh, by the way, you know, you should probably meet the traveling artist we got. He pitched a tent over there in Pat's barn. And so actually the population was 12 for that week that I got there. This guy had just come through painting murals, a traveling mural painter. And he just happened to be in this town of 11 people the week I got there. And he said, yeah, you know, I think the river towns are a lot like, you know, Alaska gets a lot of these places too. We get, um, Mm -hmm. we, we we just collect these these people. Another thing that happened there's a there's a um, when he was in Louisiana, Dick Conant he, he he's coming down he came down the uh, this is in I think 2009 he he did a trip he came all the way down the Mississippi and then he was going across the Gulf to go and upstream on a succession of rivers Mo the Mobile and the Tom Bigby and mm -hmm. the Tennessee and so forth. He, he's looking for another another one of those set of wheels to to, to walk his <laughs> canoe uh, a little bit give himself a break from the, from the salt water. And he asks a guy in a pickup truck for a ride to a hardware store. The guy says, hop in. They're driving to the pickup truck. They see another guy walking with a backpack and, and they stop to get, hear that guy's story. It turns out that guy's walking, I forget which direction. He's walking from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean after having just done the, the reverse direction. Just, so two guys in one afternoon intersect with the same pickup truck. Yeah. One of them is going this way and this way in a canoe. One of them goes this way and this way by foot. And they just, they have a way of <laughs> intersecting. Like, these people are magnetized to one another. But, um. <laughs> we get a, we get a, a good taste of, um, I mean, w Dick's existence, day-to-day -day existence, I mean, it's sort of like, I, I, I think we get a flavor from his writings, and I think it's done, I, I in your book, but this was not a guy who was a morose guy. I mean, I think he may have had mo mood swings, but there's a passage where he's sitting on the bank at like eight in the morning, drinking beer, and it just sounds like... Reading the, Chaucer. Chaucer, right, yeah. reading Chaucer. Yeah. And it just sounds like the most... Yeah, and drinking Tabasco out of the yeah. bottle. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And he just, he was a teenager, he, or he yeah. wasn't even a teenager. He was an infant in these yeah. moments where right. he would just do whatever he wanted to do, and he didn't have anybody to tell him not to do it. And yeah. it's, 
you know, it's sort of like it's, it's counterbalanced by the moments when he's in town and he's been working for a while and he realizes that, you know, people are noticing, you know, things about him. Uh, but it's like this moments of just absolute joy that he had. Yeah, for sure. Well, and that's, you know, part of the thing that I think for a lot of people uh, who, were, who were able to look past his arguably frightening appearance um, the thing that, that appeals to people is the sense of freedom that he represents. So sort of like, you know, he, he can do that, right? He, what, what, I, I feel like I can't be sitting on the riverbank, you know, eating. By, by the way, his favorite food, or, well, I don't know about favorite, but his staple while traveling, it was kind of another one of these life hacks that he'd come up with was pickled hot dogs. Um, so he would, because they, he could preserve, it was a good source of protein, and he could preserve them because he couldn't count on always having ice you know, if he's going long stretches between towns. So the, br the brine of the pickle juice would preserve these meats for a long time. Um, so I have lots of pictures that people sent me of him holding up his jar, and he, he, he did the same thing to me and showed me. So, you know, he's, he's eating, a, you know, a hot dog and, and drinking beer and, and Tabasco sauce and reading Chaucer at 8 in the morning. This is the kind of thing that, yeah, a 13-year-old might think is, is cool, yeah. and you can do it. And there's, and he, he was, he would luxuriate in it, but at the same time, Part of what I liked about him, I could tell this even in my conversations with him um, before he went missing, is that he wasn't kind of like an evangelist for this. He wasn't like you. He wasn't the kind of person who's like trying to lead your kids away. Right. Like you too could read Chaucer and drink Tabasco at eight in the morning. It was, you know, he was like, look, there are costs associated with this. Like this is a solution to my problem. I'm I'm enjoying some some freedom and and sort of rekindling my my teenage sense of self. But I don't have what you have, and I wish I could, but I can't, yeah. and so this is what I'm doing. He wanted, he, he wanted the straight life. He wanted the house, the picket fence. The over kids. and over again in his, in his notes. You know, and the, he the picket always, fence. The, the, the I think he always had held out hope that the next time, you know, when he got off the river and went back and, 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 and got a job, that it would actually take. Sure. Yeah. Well, and that's the sense in which, you know, the, 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 the river trip, it was a kind of, it was, it was self-care, it was therapy, and there right. As, the, as these trips went on, I think one of the things I detected was he really seemed to believe the first couple times that he was going to cure his problem in a, like, in a more than short-term sense, right? You know, right. I'm, I'm in a jam here. Nobody likes me. This isn't working. I'm frustrated. I'm going to go out on the river. I'm going to fall in love with America again. It's going to be great. And then, I'm, and then, and then I'm, you know, my mood will be stabilized. I'll go, I'll, my talents will reassert themselves, and then it will work. Yeah, I can go to med school. Yeah. I can, yeah. And, you know, I think we all are susceptible to that kind of wishful thinking. And as, you know, if you, as parents, you look, you can see your kids falling prey to that kind of thought process again and again. What, what he learned is that eventually he would pay sort of half lip service to the idea that that was what was going on. But he also was clear that he, well, he recognized that the, the kind of the foreground and the background had switched in his life. The, the, the river trip wasn't, it wasn't like a vacation to reset his normal life. It was becoming the thing that he lived for. Right. And, the, and the, the stuff in between the trips was actually the stuff that you should kind of fade, fade to blur and just, just wait until we get that back on the river again. Well, you, you've read his journals and you've seen his photographs and you've seen his artwork and you've seen, you know, and you've, you've, uh, you probably know more about him now than even his family members. Who, yeah. I think uh, they would agree to that. Yeah. I, do you th do you think that he could have you know published these journal or you know published this chronicle of his trip down the river? I mean, I think he, what he had two different um, uh, manuscripts of a couple thousand pages or something like that. Uh, I I don't. The writing yeah. is good, uh, but, but it's. It, but it was, it was, you know, it suffered from the thing a lot of writing suffers from, which is it was sort of, I don't want to say unedited, because he did a lot of s editing, but it was unfilled, you know, it, he had a very hard time distinguishing from, you know, between, like, what's essential here and what's boring here, and so he right. just put it all down, which, from my perspective, was helpful. I didn't, I didn't want him to call. I, I, right. It's easier for me if I can get the whole body of work and then take out what's interesting, and I... You know, I, I, do, I did see my role in some ways as trying to help him tell his story the way he wanted to. I mean, he told me about these manuscripts when we were talking on the river, and he mentioned that he might at some point, if our relationship developed, send me some of his writing right. um, with the idea of getting it published. He yeah. did I I imagine that. 
the problem is the writing is mostly just like this happened, then this happened, then this happened, yeah. then this happened, then this happened. I mean, it's, it's just in, he's you know, there's something a little bit almost like Aspergersian about him. Of right. Just like it's just detail after detail, which from a reporting standpoint is a great gift. It's I mean, a he, great trope. He's not. He he wasn't really a poet. He was a journalist, and so he just recorded facts about his life. Yeah. And yeah, and, and helps to shape that a little bit. Yeah, and 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 the the thing is, is that I'm 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 trying to you know, like come to this idea of Dick as as this as he was doing probably what his highest and best use might be. You know what I'm saying? And there might be some guilt uh, among the people that met him along the way because he was doing this very dangerous thing. But as we talked, we talked about this off stage, he was doing this very dangerous thing, but he was not reckless within the parameters of that very dangerous thing he was doing. He was a careful, resourceful guy. But, but he still, always wore a life jacket and would lecture the young men he met on the river about not, about not taking off their life jacket and that kind of but thing. But still, apparently, and I mean, I guess there is still a chance that he got out of the boat and walked away, you know, but apparently he met a bad end, and I mean, that, that, that cuts two ways. Number one, it's sort of like, well, you know, what could you have done to, you know, you, you, he's a grown man, he's a 60-year-old man, you can't save him, but at the same time, it's like, eh, it would have been nice if he could have, you know, if he could still be here. Yeah, I mean, I, so I grappled with this a little bit because uh, fairly early on after he disappeared, I got, a, I got a note from a guy who had gone to high school with him but who long since lost touch, a guy who lived out west, who said, just sort of from his remembering of the family and stuff, oh, you know, he didn't need, a, Dickie Conant didn't need an article in the New Yorker, he needed an intervention. Um, uh -huh. And I get it. I, I, and I, I, I struggle with that. I mean, I, look, when I first met him, as I said at the beginning of this talk, just inherently when you meet someone 63 years old going down the, the, the coast by himself, you know not everything's right. Um, and he, and he, but he told me some stuff about, his, about his, his, his complicated family relationships. He was one of nine kids. And there was a part of me that, that wanted to reach out to one of his brothers who lived near me. He told me that. Um, even at the time, just to say, hey, I met your brother. And I struggled with it, and I decided not to because I just sort of thought it really isn't my place. Families are yeah. big, and they're complicated, and this, he's a grown man. He gets to decide uh, you know, what he's doing with his time. But then, of course, when he disappeared a few months later, there's a yeah, there's this stab of, of, of regret. But what I would say, where I feel justified in my, in my hesitation is that reading his writing, he, he grappled with the, the possibility of meeting a... Uh, an early end, a lot, a fair amount. He, you know, if you're you're spending a lot of time yeah. by yourself in dangerous settings, you, you're you're thinking about this stuff. And mm -hmm. he was pretty clear about how he believed, and I am inclined to agree, but given what I know of his life, both on water and on land, he was adamant that he would have lived less long had he not taken to the water. Mm -hmm. You know, he he embarked on these very dangerous trips, and indeed, one of them may have been his last. Had he not done that, it's also possible that he wouldn't have made it out of his 40s. I mean, he right. was really in a bad way when he was on land. Yeah, I mean, he yeah he was probably pre-diabetic and he probably had Correct. a lot of problems. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to mention that if anybody has a question, please walk up to one of the microphones and we will acknowledge you then. Uh, but otherwise, we're just going to keep going. So you know, uh, that the, th the thing about it is that the, the, you did though. I mean, now we know who he is. Now we have his story. And there's a lot of stories, you know, we never get, of course. We're never going to, to know most stories about most people. What I kept being struck by when I was reading the book is that every, these characters would pop up and I go, that's another book. That's another guy. That's another person. Yeah. And I think it's really kind of true of just about everybody if you can break through and get the story from them. It's just about all of them. They're not all as uh, dramatic or as... Uh, uh, I mean, Dick is a useful metaphor for a lot of people. You can make him stand for whatever you want him to stand for. You know, I mean, uh, like you said, the guy said, well, he needed an intervention. This could be about the tragedy of our mental health system. You know, it could be about the freedom of the open road and the American, you know, uh, individual 
<laughs> you could do all kinds of these games with it, but some of these people were just amazing, you know? And I, yeah, I mean, you know, one dangerous. of the lessons that I, I took from it certainly was these are, people are interesting, right? People are pretty weird, and when you get to know them, like beyond, and, and, and sort of, if you can manage to not be, you know, so, sort of so judgmental in your body language that they kind of hide th this or that yeah. uh, aspect of themselves. Um, a lot of people have interesting stories to tell. And, and it's true that I mentioned earlier, I used the word magnetized, right? There, some of these people tend to kind of attract one another. So I'm not going to say that Dick Conant didn't expose me to slightly more exotic people than, than the average, because he did. But yeah, there were, a, there were a number of characters who I met then along the way who, who kind of seemed to be almost raising their hand, being like, I, I'll lead you this way. Like, I'm going to run away with it. Like, now that I've got your attention, let me tell you my story. Um, and it, it was almost always, almost always, uh, wor worth it. Like, worth, worth being like, ah, oh, this guy's kind of annoying. <laughs> Actually, this is weird. Actually, this is true. Um, and it, that would happen again and again. Uh, you know, I met this guy, again, in a tiny town, population 32, Rome, Indiana. And he was sort of, you know, a little glassy-eyed, drinking Miller Lights by the river, and and he's he's a guy. He's like, you know, I've I've never left this town. Like, I would never. This to me, yeah. this, is, this is as good as it gets. Like, he just watches the 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 flotsam and jetsam, you know. Uh, but he's like, oh, you know, it's interesting you mentioned this because I have a cousin uh, who uh, she rode across across the Atlantic Ocean, and I was like, well, he's like, actually, well, she actually did it twice because the first time is she capsized and she had to be rescued by the Coast Guard. Um, and I'm thinking, like, all right. Yeah. And, and then he's like, actually, no, not only that, but she's, she's going to go to Mars. And I'm like, okay, now this guy's looking at the can, like the pile of empties in the... Yeah. In the, in the um, he's like, no, no, she's, you know, she's on a list. They had some competition. She's on a list of, like, the top 500 people. She's, she's going to be one of the first 500 people to go to Mars. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I, f I learned his name. I figured out who she was. She rode per crew for Purdue. Um, but she's now a scientist in New Zealand. So I, I emailed her. I was like, I think I met your cousin. Um, <laughs> turns out she did uh, get rescued by the Coast Guard near Barbados. She did then successfully row with, with two other women, row across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, she is actually in a list on the list of 50 people, not 500, to go to Mars through NASA because she is a, like an astrophysicist. Um, and, and then she's like, you know, she, I, I said something about how, like, wow, life is amazing. She's like, life really is amazing. I, last weekend, I just ran a half marathon here in, in New Zealand, and I'm running the half marathon, and this guy comes up next to me, and he's wearing one of those tall, like, Barney the Dinosaur suits. You know, you ever seen those Halloween costumes that are, like, puffy and blow up? So she's running this marathon next to, like, a Halloween costume dinosaur, and so they start talking. Turns out that guy also rode across the Atlantic Ocean. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Well, have at, please. So I'm just curious from a journalist's point of view, uh, what were these introductions when you went to these little towns? How did you sort of introduce yourself to the people? And once you said his name, was that the calling card? Um, so when there, there were two different ways. Uh, I would either, sometimes I would call people on the phone. I don't have Facebook, so it made it a little more challenging, but I, a lot of times he would write down people's phone numbers, so I, I would just call people on the phone, the cold calls, and I would usually say something like, sorry, this is going to sound a little strange, I'm calling from New York, but by any chance, do you remember a large man in overalls in a canoe? And that would do it, and they'd be like, are you kidding me? We were just talking about that guy. Um, so that was the, but it, it, in, the, in the cases where I, sh there were some towns where I would just show up, and what I would do there is I have, I'd have a prop, and the prop would be like his manuscript. He, so he had, he'd written... Uh, as Philip mentioned, he'd written these books unpublished that I, I got from his brothers. And uh, they, were, they were like, you know, he bound them like I'd go into Kinko's, you know, with kind of like photocopies and the three rings and the thing. So I kept, when I show up in this town like with 11 people in, in Indiana, I drive in there in my rental car, I drive all the way down to the river to the dead end and I get out and I'm carrying this thing and people are like, can I help you? And I'm like, hey, I'm just, and I, and I'm like, opened the, the book to the page where he's talking about their town. I'm like, I'm, you know, I, th this guy wrote this book and you're in it, you know, can you? And that was usually enough. Um, it, having just a, some kind of prop to, to sort of divert their attention from me and be like, look at this thing. Um, often he took pictures of the places too, so that I could be like, is, am I, is this here where we are? Because he, he would like, 
he, he took pictures and he would, um, you know, tape them and put captions on them and then photocopy them. So he, you know, he, he made the book out to be kind of like a book. Um, so there would be, you know, a picture of a guy on the riverbank in this town of Indiana, and I'd, so I'd see a person, I'd be like, can you help me out? Is, like, am I looking at this picture here? And that would be kind of an icebreaker, and it would, it would go. I was, I was really fortunate. I mean, these were places that I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable going without an excuse. I mean, it's a little bit like a metaphor for tourism or anything in general. Like, having, having some, like, indirect point of entry into something really helps take it out of, like, I'm here because of not because of me, but because of this person we know in common or something. And, ha the, and in some places, in some cases, yeah, just merely the fact that I uh, knew the same person they knew meant that they would just open their doors. I mean, there was a, a town in Louisiana down at the, near the bottom of the Atchafalaya River where he'd spent maybe a little less than a week um, and there was a taxidermist there who, uh, he was going through some health problems by the time I got there, but he, he even had a copy of one, of one of these manuscripts. Dick had mailed it to him. And so the fact that we each had one of these books was like, all right, you, you know, this is like, a, it's like having the key to the town. Like everything was open to me. Like I, because we, had, we were the two possessors of this manuscript. Um. Can you talk loud, please? Because I can't hear. Uh, so um, it was my neighbor. So so I live on a on a hill that goes down to the river, and I was um, I was with my son, who was then a toddler, and we were going down to the river, as we would do sometimes, just to skip rocks or look for a sea glass or go kayaking or something. And my neighbor, who lives right on the river, um, poked his head over the stone wall and like kind of whistled, and he said, "Why don't you come inside? There's a guy in here you should meet." Um, it was just that, just an accident. And my neighbor, it turned out, I, I, this was not long after we'd moved to this town. We'd been living in the city. We moved up because um, we were flooded out of the, of the city, so we moved to another flood zone. And hmm. uh, so I, my neighbor, my, at this point, we only knew my neighbor as a kind of, this kind of, uh, well, my, actually, my wife called him Lebowski. He was a kind of like zen-like guy who kind of walked slowly around town and looked like he was always maybe a little bit stoned. And... Um, and so he just, but he, he kind of, he seemed to know people and know the town. So he just invited us in and there, it turned out he was having a birthday party. So he had six people over and at the head of the table was this guy holding forth. Um, and then it was, it was a kind of, sort of the way it kept going with this project. It was Labor Day when this happened and I was with my kid. I didn't have like a notebook and a pen. I wasn't like prepared to be a journalist. So I had this conversation with him where a little bit like you say, I was sort of like half like, what's going on here? And half like, wow, this guy's interesting. But half like, oh, my kid is like knocking furniture over in my neighbor's house. And um, so I, I left and went on with the day. And it wasn't until that night when I was like, wow, that was, I was supposed to, I, like I failed a test. I was supposed to do something with that. And I didn't. Hmm. And that's when I looked him up on Google and couldn't find him. And that was, and I, so I resolved to find him again. Yeah. And that's set in forth this whole sequence of things that like, it almost slipped away. It didn't slip away. It almost slipped away, and that was sort of a little bit like when he when he went missing. It was sort of like he could I could have just let it go, but then his family reached out to me, and then one thing after another. In the beginning of your book, you tell the story about when you're living in Brooklyn, and the hurricane comes, and you're right. you flood your basement yeah. floods, and you go down the basement and you find this fish, fish yes. in the basement, and you think, oh my God, this is some sea monster that's come in here. Right. And the, the punchline is it turns out to be your neighbor's koi from your koi pot. Right. And yeah, I, I, I had been, you know, again, the, the romantic in me, as you maybe you can tell, yeah. I have this streak. The romantic in me is thinking like, well, at least, you know, at least there's like a barracuda coming to our house. Like the wild has invaded my, my, my urban Dick is, Dick Conant is not a koi fish from the neighbor's house. He right. is something wild. that has, He's right. like a grizzly bear or something that's, right. that's, that's shown up. And you, you recognize that, and you had the yeah. sense to go after it. But yeah, it so, and part of that is like, you know, as a journalist, uh, you know, you get, you get flooded with, with, pe with attention seekers. People will, you know, the internet makes it real easy, email, for people to send you a kind of their own handmade press release that says, you know, I aim to be the first person, you know, to speak 12 languages on the corner of 42nd and Broadway, and I'll be doing it at 1 p.m. next Tuesday. Like, will you be there? And... 
that kind of attention seeking, the sort of the, the, the level of self-consciousness of that, you, you, you get exposed to it enough and it becomes a turnoff. And right. so that, yeah, that, that guy is, a, the, the person who's doing that on 42nd and Broadway is a coy. And Dick Conan is, you know, he's a sturgeon or something. He's yeah, they're looking to be on a reality TV show. Those people right. are. And Dick Conan is just this authentic, to use a, right. you know, kind of uh, pure product of America. This crazy person who shows up, right. who's doing these crazy things. Now, God, reporting this book, I don't know how long it took, but to report it and write it probably took, what, six years, seven years? Yeah, six years about, yeah. And you had COVID in there where you... Uh, yeah, well, COVID it prolonged it because because my at that point I had two kids and they were they were they couldn't go to school so they were in the house and they had to be supervised doing Zoom kindergarten and second grade, and so it's hard to you know you're you're in the closing stretches of finishing a book that's already taken you too long and and you're you know relearning simple addition on Zoom and it's yeah. it's it, it it takes your mind away a little bit. Now this could go either way. It's like. You've been with this story for so long, and you're still with it because you're here talking to us about it right now. And it is a mystery that has not been solved. Do you want to just let it go? Or are you going to like pay attention to any further? I mean, I'm, spoiler alert: we don't really know what happened to Dick. You know, sure. are, is there going to be any further reporting on this, or is this like, let's just put this away? I mean, a little of both. More, I mean, it's, I don't think it'll go away. People still email me on a, I would say, in the past week, I got two emails uh, from people. That in, in these cases, they weren't strangers. They were old friends of his who had just fa uncovered old letters he'd written them uh, while cleaning their house. But sometimes it's, a, it's another stranger who comes upon the book and says, oh, by the way, you know, I don't know if you are interested, but I met this guy on this, you know, would you like to hear? Uh, now, in the case of strangers, again, so copious was was Dick's own self documentation that, almost without exception, when those people come forward to me, I'm able to cross reference them in his notes and be like, "Oh yeah, that was on May 7, 2010. I know. Yeah. I, I, I knew you met him, but it just didn't sound interesting enough. I'm sorry, I didn't call you." Um, but anyway, yeah, people still come out, and I'm I'm obviously I'm open to to, to hearing more. I, to me, in some ways, the people who who find that kind of indirect way in and, and then want to lead off on their own story are are just as interesting to me as the people who are going to tell me more about yet another encounter with, with this guy. Okay, for the most part, Dick seems to be this very reliable narrator in his journals. Yeah. He seems to tell the truth. He seems to be one of these people who's meticulous about detail and he... I, 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 he's got a journalistic instinct. You're right. Now, there is one part of the book that is very interesting and maybe shouldn't be, but uh, there was a woman in his life, maybe, mm -hmm. and you weren't able to, to, to verify much about this at all, but uh, apparently he had this uh, sweetheart. Yeah, sweetheart was the term he used. They, they weren't officially you know, engaged, but but they were faithful to each other. He, he, he charmed a bunch of people in my town with this story. Um, her name was Tracy. Um, and he would tell people about her everywhere he went. Uh, lots of people, you know, I would, when I would, in doing this work of following up with people, you know, I'm going to Woody's Lounge and I meet the bartender. like, oh yeah, what about, he had this woman, right? What, what was her name again? Um, so uh, I can tell you, you know, I, I, because he documented everything, I, I know the exact date that they met. It was in, Livingston, Montana, in, 19, in July of 1999, um, he was packing his boat. She was walking her dog. Her dog was named Haley. It was a Chesapeake Bay Retriever. Um, over time, it seems clear to me that she kind of evolves into something more like a literary device than a human being. Right. Um, people, you know, his family members and, and other people who were skeptical of him tend to, to just have defaulted to the idea that she's not real. It's a little more complicated than that. There is, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that there is a woman named Tracy who had a dog named Haley, and it was a Chesapeake Bay Retriever, and she was in Livingston, Montana on this date. That happened. You will not convince me it didn't. Um, what she became after that probably has no relationship to who she actually is. All right. Uh, so, and the, the, to, to make it kind of most poignant, the, the one detail I found, I was in, I was to Bozeman, Montana, is where he'd been living in between these trips. I, I visited the library there. He spent a lot of time there while he was working on his manuscripts. Um, 
met some librarians there who didn't think all that highly of him, as people who met him on land didn't tend to. Uh, and they told this story that was a little bit uncharitable, but I, I get it, where they all, you know, he was a known character. He's a big guy, you, you know, you don't forget him. So he, he shows up, there was a public concert on the lawn in front of the library, and he shows up and he's carrying a bouquet of flowers. Um, and they just all stood by the window and watched as he roamed the grounds looking for someone to, who he was expecting to come receive those flowers, and, and that didn't happen. Um, you know, I, obviously that's sad, uh, but there's, I, I, I kept challenging myself not to, not to see it as, as quite that sad in the sense that I kind of think that all of us have Tracys in our lives. There may not be women, but there's, there, there's something, maybe it's like a book you're gonna write that you're never really gonna write, but you have to, like half of you has to believe you're gonna write it, because otherwise you're never gonna believe in yourself in this other way. Or, or there's, you know, that, that mountain you're gonna climb and you're, you're training for it, but probably it's never gonna happen. And, uh, and, and, you know, when you talk to your wife about it or something like that, she, she can't help but roll her eyes and be like, oh, that fucking mountain again. Like, it's not, <laughs> but, Seriously, like it's, it, I, I call it in the book a beacon in the fog. It, it actually is important for all of us to have something to be kind of orienting ourselves towards that even if you know on, there's a part of you that, that knows that it's impractical, it is psychologically important. And in his case, you know, he was sort of borrowing a kind of a bit of a trite trope. I mean, it's, right. it goes back to Dante and, and I mean, this is, or, or Don Quixote, right. you know, it does, the, 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 the knight errant with his with his princess that he's that he's barely ever met, who he's trying to please. But it was for Dick Conan, especially this guy who's kind of untethered to to longstanding relationships, to if to the extent that he invented a a, a long a, a one relationship that really mattered to him, I think he needed it. I mean, he would write at the times in a kind of very self aware way in his journals about how you know Tracy won't you know won't won't be ready for me if I'm chasing tail and, and drinking too much. Like, right. I'll never write these books if I'm doing that. Yeah. So he was never gonna write these manuscripts if, if it weren't for trying to please Tracy. He wanted, you know, he wanted to do, he needed some, some structure to his life. He can't always just read Chaucer at eight in the morning while you're drinking Tabasco sauce. Yeah, yeah she's the, uh, the light at the end of the dock, you know, yeah. across the sound. And uh, one of the things that is, I think, is subtext in this in this book is I I think that you wrote it for a lot of people, but one of the people I, the people I think that might appreciate it most are Dick's family. I mean, I think that this gives them a, this sort of gives them back their brother, you know, uh, because he did have all these siblings, and he was sort of like a lost guy. I mean, he was like, uh, um, and you've talked. To, I, I guess you've contacted all of them and talked to all of them and they've all got their various they, reactions. But so they were, they couldn't have been more helpful. Right. Uh, and, and yeah, the way they put it to me was that they wanted to give him a legacy and if I, from their perspective, uh, in this, you know, it was a helpful perspective. So when I first went out to open the, the one of the storage lockers in Montana, I went with his uh, older brother, Joe. Joe was the one who had the, the, you know, the, the moral confidence to, to use a, a, a wrench to break the padlock and just bust his way in. I wouldn't have felt entitled to do that. But Joe looked inside and kind of sighed and was like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, this is, this is my brother. You know, he just saw a mess. And I get it. Like, if you have that kind of person in your family and you knew him as a, as a sort of bright, smiling young boy and in your life it's just been all sadness yeah. you know, from your take, from the sense of him and, and your relationship is strained, you can't help but look at that and think, like, if only. For me, it was it was easier because I didn't feel implicated. It wasn't complicated. I tried to be sympathetic. I, I tried to understand all those dynamics, but I could read that stuff without being personally wounded or hurt by it. And so, yeah, I, I did think I was trying to help not just him but his family sort right. of see a different version of him because they, like many people, they a they didn't really believe his stories about the canoe trips. They right. just kind of thought there's no way this is all really true, partly because because. Some of the stories were intertwined with tales about Tracy, and they were like, that didn't happen. Um, so I wanted to be like, this is true. This, this guy told a lot of stories, and they were really true. To take it back to your kind of an earlier part of your career, you were fact-checking again. You yeah. were going through this, and you fact-checked Dick's story. It turned out to be true, at least, you know, yeah. essentially. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, 
from the beginning, it, yeah. there was this kind of, a, like, this is a bit of a folk hero, superhero character. He's, there's something that's just Im too implausible about all this, and yet my job is to, is to prove that it's actually true, and it's like a true folk tale. If anybody wants to ask the question, we've got time for one more. Yes, uh, uh, Brian, speak up, because, I, again, I can't hear. So it, it's, it's interesting. It's complicated in part because he's not legally dead. Um, so they don't even have the right. Uh, so we, I, um, with the, in terms of quoting, well, that's another reason why we couldn't, like, you know, you couldn't just publish his journals right. as is right now because that's his decision to make. Now, it's been enough time. I know, so there was a time when they tried to get a, a legal finding of death, um, and they were told by North Carolina that, because of the nature of his itinerant life, they'd have to wait seven years. Um, uh, yeah, and so that seven years has passed, but the, 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 the point when they were interested in it uh, preceded that. Um, so we, you know, I quoted only, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using his stuff mostly as source material for my own uh, re-narration of his stories. When I'm quoting him, I'm, I'm doing it within the, what at least the lawyers tell me is the fair use bounds. I'm quoting, you know, 60 words at a time here and there, mm -hmm. rather than whole pages of of, of his prose. Um, we did uh, reproduce a few of his um, paintings and photographs in the in the book. In the hardcover, they're in color. In the paperback, they're in black and white. Um, with the uh, good graces of the family, that's just a. a, a that was a decision that the publisher's lawyer took that said, if the family's okay with it, we'll take our chances on that. But yeah, if Dick is alive, he, he could probably file a copyright claim against those. And not, not, a, not, not the text of the book, but against the reproduction of those images. Yeah. yeah. It, it was hard. Um, I mean, not... Not even around the snippets wasn't hard because that's kind of what you do often in, in journalism. I mean, that's that's standard in magazine work. Often you're 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 going to allude to this or that book, and you're going to say, you know, blah blah blah, as Hemingway wrote, blah blah blah, and then you move on. And you're not you don't need permission from Hemingway to do that. Um, ha interweaving my own sort of journey through this story with his version of it was a, a real writing challenge and structural challenge, and that's part of why it took me as long as it did, mm. which is too long. I mean, it, it, I, I definitely struggled with it, because it was, I wanted it to be his story, but I couldn't avoid involving <laughs> myself, because I was sort of, because of the, the, the random way in which I was drawn into it, both through meeting him by accident on the river, and then being the first person that the authorities called when his boat was found, I, I felt that I was a part of the story, and I couldn't avoid it. Yeah, you were braided into this story. I didn't really want to take over ever at too much time, so that balance was 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 a real challenge. And I, I don't know if I got it right. I just that's up to other people. Okay, one more, <laughs> please. A three. Uh, Correct, yeah, I mean, so one of the things that I lucked out in is, so, you know, when I first uh, was doing this, I imagined just a short, a talk of the town story in the New Yorker, those were like 700 words, you know, they're just little short items, and it was just about, a, you know, an interesting guy doing an unusual thing, coming down past New York in a canoe. Uh, I lucked out in the, in the sense that, so, you know, New Yorker stories, I, and I began my career this way, are, are heavily fact-checked, and not just you know, in, in a way, like, everyone he has to be re-interviewed by, by someone other than the author to make sure the author isn't, isn't inventing details. And that was going to be very difficult here. And I, you know, one of the things I said to him, I went back the second day as I was thinking ahead to the story. I said, you know, is there a way we can reach you? My neighbor had told me that he had a cell phone. And I was like, you know, the phone, he's like, ah. he hadn't turned on that phone. It was, uh, there was no battery to the phone. 
He did have a laptop with him. It was buried deep into one of the dry bags in the canoe, but he wasn't planning to plug the laptop in until he got to Florida. That was where he was going to write about the trip. So he was, he was just sort of, you know, he, you know, he was self-possessed in a way that I kind of admired. He, he was like, I'm not going to make this any easier for you. Like, I'm doing this for me. I'm not doing this for you. I'm happy to talk to you. You're welcome to write about it, but I'm on my way. Once I'm, once I'm on my way, you know, you could, and I did email him after the story came out. He would check in at libraries along the way and check his email. He had a Gmail account. Um, but, uh, you know, he wasn't going to make sure to do that in, on our schedule. So, with that contingency in mind, I brought a tape recorder the second and third days and tried to record him saying as much as I could possibly think anyone might, might want to know. I was sort of pre-editing and fact-checking in my mind, sort of trying to ask him all the things that any like a skeptical editor or fact-checker might then ask me if I was asked to revise a draft so that we would have a record that they could verify because otherwise if I... They weren't going to have any way of checking it. So I, when, when, it, when the time came for me to go deeper on the story, I benefited from the fact that I had had a much more extensive kind of, you know, quizzical kind of conversation with him than I might have otherwise done because I was worried about the ability to fact check, even just a little thing. We've really got to go. But come to the microphone and ask a question, and we'll, let, we'll get you in. That's it, though. We had 15 minutes earlier. Could have I think this is fascinating stuff, and I see a sequel, maybe even a Netflix docu-series or something. But hey, are you available to? Uh, I will definitely, I will definitely sign okay. that. And I, you know, there is a chance. That, I mean, there's a, a, a guy has optioned the the rights to do something with cinematically. So we'll see what what happens there. Now, I have been told that you should evaluate these sessions on your way out. So I'm like the guy at Comcast five telling stars. you, please give me yeah. the, please give me the, f if you can't give me a five stars, don't give me anything. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Uh, so look, one of the things that some people, my neighbor is one of them, uh, have, it, the open-ended nature of, of the story, some people like to believe that he, he just sort of, like he was already living a life on his own terms the way he wanted to live it, that he just, he left the canoe, he went and did another thing. It would be great if that were true. The reason I don't think it's true, but you never know, is that, um, so they, uh, they put a, they checked his bank account. Uh, because he, he's been collecting Social Security every, every month. There have been no transactions on that account mm -hmm. since the day the canoe was found. The only thing, the only transactions, and at some point this is going to amass a decent amount of money, is that every month Social Security continues depositing into that account. But he had been, a, he, you know, he used a credit card when he would get to towns to buy this or that, to buy his hot dogs to put in the pickle jar. Um, and he hasn't done that since that day. So, you know, it's possible. The only, and then the other thing I would say is, if you've been through his, his journals and his notes, as I have, and, and the storage lockers, I mean, keep in mind, one of them was in Utah. Uh, he hadn't lived in Utah since the early 90s. He was still, in 2014, like in upstate New York, going to a post office, like coming off the river, walking to a post office, and mailing a rent check to a storage locker in Utah mm. because he, those materials were important to him. And again, if you look through the records, as I've done, of the material that's in that, there aren't really many gaps. I mean, you could imagine, you know, someone like this maybe is in a fugue state and, and something is, you know, he emerges six years later. There are no real six-year or whatever gaps in his history prior to this happening where, we, where I don't know what he was doing. He, he really kept a pretty faithful record of what he was doing all the time. Um, so it seems unlikely to me that someone who cared that much about his material, because also in these storage lockers, it wasn't just journals, it was like oil paintings, like hundreds, yeah. um, w rolled up like rugs, um, but like really big, like impressive works. He, you know, he, he had done stuff that mattered to him, uh, and I, it just seems hard for me to imagine that he just gave it all up, but yeah. it's possible. possible. Okay, Ben, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> if you haven't read the book, I'd recommend it. Enjoy the rest of the festival and enjoy your rest of your time in the world.